welcome to our first live broadcast, Healthcare Fraud, What You Need to Know. I'm Sheila Davis, a Public Affairs Specialist for the Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Inspector General, and I'm moderating today's discussion. Joining me are two healthcare fraud experts, OIG's Assistant Inspector General for Investigations, Shimon Richman, and Dr. Michael Cohen, an Operations Officer with the Office of Investigations. Together, they have 25 years of fraud fighting experience. If you have questions during our discussion, please send them via Facebook. And if you're watching us on Twitter, tweet using the hashtag, Ask an Investigator. So let's get started. Healthcare fraud wastes taxpayer dollars and can significantly harm people and patients, including those who have Medicare or Medicaid. Shimon, can you start by explaining what healthcare fraud is and maybe share a few of the most common schemes? My pleasure, Sheila. Healthcare fraud is a crime of theft and a crime of deception. Uh, and because of that deception, oftentimes the fraud looks like just the provision of regular healthcare services on its surface. It may not be apparent to the naked eye that something is actually wrong. Uh, as we dig into our healthcare fraud investigations, we find a variety of common schemes. Uh, the first is uh, billing for services not rendered. Uh, it's very simply billing for things that never occurred or maybe billing for uh, a, a wheelchair or a back brace or something that the patient never received. Uh, we also see frequently inflating of services. Um, so you may have a patient that went to a doctor and they had, for example, their blood drawn, had some lab tests. Uh, but in addition to the tests that they actually did undergo, uh, the, the lab or the provider bills for additional tests uh, that weren't, didn't actually occur, just in order to inflate the reimbursement from Medicare Medicaid and increase their profits. Uh, <laughs> and Mike, what, what have you seen? Uh, in addition to that, you may see some misrepresentation of services. So maybe a non-covered service that's actually billed as a covered service. So uh, for example, someone may be getting massages and they'll bill it as um, like uh, 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 physical therapy, something like that. In the world of pharmaceuticals, we may see uh, drugs that are expensive uh, specialty drugs that are billed and not dispensed uh, or medically unnecessary services. DME supplies like back braces and knee braces and neck braces, that type of thing. Uh, di diabetes testing strips uh, that, aren't, that aren't requested or, or uh, needed. Uh, or most recently genetic testing, which we can talk about as well. Okay. Um, so how does healthcare fraud impact a person? Walk me through what someone might experience from unmedic unnecessary medical tests or being charged for services that they didn't need. Well, you can imagine the medical tests on their face are not, not pleasant to go through anyway, much less going through unnecessary blood draws or uh, procedures such as biopsies or something that w weren't even necessary to begin with. Uh, also, uh, you may get, we see people getting imaging studies, which involves radiation. We even had an oncologist a few years ago that was falsely diagnosing people with cancer and was giving them radiation therapy as well as chemotherapy. So that was a really egregious example. And this is done so that the providers can bill more despite it, it the was, best needs of the patient. It, it was all just to make money. It was just greed. Okay. Uh, Shimon. You know, in, in addition to the potential physical harm or, or uh, uh, issues that patients can endure, they also uh, face some financial risk uh, as well as risk to their benefits. Um, in the financial arena, they may incur, you know, expensive co-pays and other costs that uh, aren't medically necessary and the otherwise wouldn't incur if the provider was acting in their best interest uh, as opposed to uh, looking to increase their bottom line. Additionally, there are many benefits that have limits. And so if those benefits are, are exhausted in Medicare's view because they've been billed, for example, say for a power wheelchair that they actually didn't receive or didn't need, uh, and then uh, you know, some time elapses and that patient develops a legitimate medical need for that power wheelchair, uh, in Medicare's view, uh, that claim may be denied because Medicare believes they've already been provided one, and so they're no longer eligible to receive, uh, you know, that item or that service. And so it can cause real uh, uh, problems for a patient's benefits uh, should they legitimately need them at a later point in time. So it can cause physical harm and financial harm. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so now we've heard about some common schemes. Can you give the viewer some tips on how they can protect themselves? 
certainly. Uh, some of the uh, quick and easy things that all patients can do, um, first and foremost, look at that letter that comes in the mail, that explanation of benefits that, that comes in the mail from Medicare that lists on there what items and services Medicare is paying on behalf of the patient. Um, for example, uh, check if the date of service uh, on, on that uh, explanation of benefits uh, it looks, uh, lines up with the date that you last went to the provider. See if you recognize the provider name on there that is billing services to Medicare and if that is in fact one of your, your doctors. Uh, and, and maybe scan through quickly. This all takes a matter of seconds to look through the services being billed and, and if those uh, line up with the services that you received when you went to your, uh, to your doctor. Uh, and and if, if somebody on Medicare is reviewing that statement and they see something that isn't correct, um, should they call their doctor first? When do they reach out to the OIG if they may, if they may suspect fraud? Those AOB statements can be very complicated to, to weed through, so sometimes it's best just to pick up the phone and call your provider, and sometimes they can clear it up right over the phone. Beyond that, if you still have some questions or the answers weren't uh, what you thought they would be, you can uh, reach out if you have uh, uh, an issue with your benefits to 1-800-MEDICARE or the uh, SHIP program, the state health insurance program, who can discuss the, the, uh, the benefits and, and what you've received. Uh, if you're thinking more along the lines uh, of fraud, you can start out with uh, Senior Medicare Patrol who can go over your, your statement and the provision of care. And if they think that there's something uh, that doesn't look right, uh, they can assist you in reporting it to our hotline, our 1-800-TIPS, uh, HHS TIPS, and report it as fraud. Okay. And that's really important that it's very easy and accessible for folks to report their concerns or suspected fraud to us, either through the hotline at 1-800-HHS-TIPS or through our website at oig.hhs.gov. Okay. Great. So we've talked about now reviewing uh, the explanation of benefits and Medicare summary notice. What else are some of the, the things that might be common in scams? You talk about what people should do to protect themselves. So if, say, they're approached by somebody at a health fair or they get a knock on the door or the phone rings. Well, it, 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 that's, a, that's a great point, Sheila, because we do commonly see um, uh, patients fall prey to scammers and healthcare uh, fraudsters um, in parking lots of shopping centers and other stores uh, being approached and solicited for a product or for a service. Uh, at a, walking by a kiosk in the mall and, and uh, or through uh, an unsolicited phone call, uh, marketing to them, you know, some product or some service like a cancer screening test um, that is at no cost to you, and Medicare will pay, you know, 100%, you know, of the costs. And um, the most important uh, piece of advice that we can give patients is know who you're dealing with. Um, when I want care, I, I, I identify uh, the doctor that I, have, I know and I have trust and, and confidence in and I seek out that care. Um, don't accept uh, uh, care or device uh, services or products from, from someone that you don't know and certainly don't uh, hand over your Medicare or your other uh, uh, benefit information uh, to someone that you don't know and that you don't trust. Mike, anything else to yeah, add? So, sometimes uh, patients have told us that uh, when they get, receive these solicitations, that your doctor told me to call you type of thing. So if, if you don't think that that's the case, call your doctor first before you engage with them. Uh, we've even seen people coming door to door and knocking. Um, so you have to be very careful just because they're in scrubs doesn't always mean that they're medical professionals. And it's important to remember that um, uh, Medicare doesn't call patients and ask for their information or solicit services to them. Uh, so if someone calls a patient and, and is uh, marketing themselves as calling from Medicare, um, that's, be, a red flag. that's a red flag. That's a red flag. Be, be, be very wary. Right, because Medicare has their information. Absolutely. There's no need for Medicare to call. And a lot of times they will use uh, sound-alike names. You can form a corporation that's called Medicare, and when you answer the phone and they say, I'm from Medicare, it sounds like they're from the government agency rather than a, uh, a creation of their own company. So the same principle would apply though. They should still follow up with, they can contact Medicare. A beneficiary can contact Medicare or contact their doctor. Contact their doctor. To confirm would be the anything before giving do. any information. Okay. All right, so let's go to the next question. Um, tell us what you all are doing on the ground to combat healthcare fraud. Well, our viewers should know that uh, the OIG is an organization uh, over 1,600 strong of professional uh, federal law enforcement agents, uh, attorneys, analysts, uh, data scientists, auditors, program evaluators, 
um, that are leveraging a multidiscipline approach to uh, detect, prevent, and, and deter, uh, root out fraud, waste, and abuse um, throughout the programs. And in doing so, we leverage partnerships at the federal, state, and local level with our other law enforcement agencies and health organizations and, and state agencies uh, in order to harness the power of kind of our collective uh, tools and abilities uh, in order to protect the patients and the taxpayer. So um, actually, Mike, can you tell us a little bit about the exclusions program? Maybe just explain what an exclusion is and how that can help to protect uh, people and patients. We consider participation in the Medicare program a privilege. So for individuals that have committed a health care fraud, uh, we uh, eliminate them from being able to bill our federal health care programs in the future, and they are put on an exclusion list so that they can no longer do that. It could be a for a short period of time, or it could be a lifetime exclusion, depending on what they did wrong, um, and then they can no longer harm our, our beneficiaries in the future. Thank you, guys. Um, so now we're going to give the audience a chance to ask questions. If you have a question, please type it in the Facebook Live feed. Or you can, follow, you can uh, tweet us by using hashtag AskAnInvestigator. We do have some questions to get us started. So the first question, what if someone calls you saying they're from Medicare and requests your personal information over the phone? What should people do? Well, again, you know, we go back to the point we made earlier. Um, Medicare doesn't call you, um, so uh, certainly don't uh, give out your, your Medicare information over the phone. Frankly, I'd say hang up. Um, but if, in fact, uh, they are marketing some service or some product that a patient has an interest in and, and they think that they may need that to improve their care, well, that's okay. Take that information and go back and consult your primary care physician, your, your doctor that you know and that you trust and they can advise you on how to proceed if in fact it's something that will, will uh, benefit in your care. So they can take that information but they should not give any of their personal information, Absolutely name not. or anything else. Patients should protect their uh, Medicare information, their ID, uh, the same way they would uh, protect their uh, bank account information or their, or their driver's license or other sensitive documents and, and don't uh, put that in the hands of anyone that they don't know. Okay, uh, next question. So somebody says, I'm getting frequent calls from Medicare services, and uh, for free Medicare services, excuse me, and I'm told that they have a physician standing by to talk to me about the product or service. Should I do so if I'm interested? Um, a lot of that goes back to the same answer that, that Shimon gave before. First of all, nothing's free. Um, somebody's paying for that. Um, and a lot of times the, the fraudulent companies will waive the co-pays for a lot of these items as well, which is illegal. So there is a cost to the, the beneficiary for some of these services, so you have to be careful with that. Um, so when they tell you that it's at no cost to you, there, there's always a cost involved, and you should never engage with them directly on the phone or a door-to-door -door solicitation. Okay, so actually that leads into the next question. Um, if I see signs in clinics that offer free services for people on Medicare, is that legitimate? You know, again, uh, any time, you know, there's that old saying, you know, nothing in life is free. And so, you know, our, our recommendation is that folks should always be wary uh, and, and be very careful uh, when things are marketed to them as absolutely free. And if they have questions about their, their benefits and if it's legitimately covered by Medicare or, or is, is indeed free, meaning there's no out-of-pocket cost to the patient, um, then they should uh, call Medicare. Uh, or they could talk with a patient advocate and they can, uh, you know, ex uh, clarify any uh, co benefits and, and coverage determinations to know whether this is legitimate or whether there's something fishy going on. So they should use their judgment and the information that you have provided of reach out to a trusted provider yeah. first. Okay. So we do have a question from Facebook. And the question is, how are you helping physicians to detect fraud? So it's a, it's a great question. Um, the OIG doesn't just engage in enforcement um, and audits and, and litigation um, to deal with uh, fraud, but uh, as an organization, we engage in uh, events like this as well as many others to outreach and education um, to the industry. Uh, our, uh, our agents frequently will, and representatives of OIG will speak at conferences and uh, trade groups and, and others in order to, uh, again, educate providers on uh, 
the uh, what fraud is and what it isn't, uh, what is uh, accidental and, and, and the difference between uh, intentional fraud uh, in order to help them uh, avoid the mistakes uh, or the temptations uh, to engage in, in, in uh, these illicit schemes. Also the Office of Counsel will give industry guidance so if they have a question as to whether a business arrangement or something may or may not be uh, acceptable or legal or violate a law, they can inquire and, and they can get an industry guidance review of it. So that's OIG's team of attorneys yes. that can advise on a legal side to make sure um, providers are in compliance with the and rules. And that's done on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. And there's an incredible amount of information available on our website at oig.hhs.gov, um, both for educating providers, uh, uh, patients, and, and the industry at large. Thank you. So we have another question. Uh, please differentiate between a billing error and outright fraud. I don't think you want to have beneficiaries accusing their providers of fraud. Yeah, that, that would be correct, and that goes back to what Shimon said earlier, the difference between accidental billing and, and actual fraud. There's no such thing as accidental fraud. Fraud is a, a crime. There has to be an intent. You know that the, the bill is wrong, and then you submit it anyway with the intent of getting paid for it. So that's the, the criminal aspect of it. If you want to question your provider about a billing statement, uh, don't be accusatory because, like I said before, these bills can be very difficult to uh, figure out what is actually contained in them. Uh, just ask them to go over it with you. And then uh, if you still have questions, there's uh, SFP and SHIP and your health plan and others that can help you with that. And, and it's important to remember that the vast majority of providers um, are out there doing the right thing and, and operating in good faith to try to take care of patients' health care needs. Um, unfortunately, it's our job to deal with uh, the smaller portion of that population um, that are knowingly engaging in criminal acts and, and taking advantage of uh, patients and, and stealing from the taxpayer. Um, but the other thing that we do at, at OIG is that we work closely with the Department of Health and Human Services and, and specifically the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services um, to identify ways to strengthen the programs and to uh, differentiate on the front end uh, between uh, errors uh, and, and uh, potential vulnerabilities uh, through, through billing mistakes uh, versus uh, out, outright fraud uh, and those uh, schemes that look to take advantage of the system. Okay. Um, here's another question. If someone has my Medicare ID number, what harm am I exposed to? For example, in, if a home caregiver may have, hold on one second, excuse me. For example, can I give my home caregiver my ID number? So uh, again, our recommendation is um, know who you're, you're giving your information to and know who you're receiving care from. Um, unfortunately, many times we will see uh, providers that will trick a patient into, through some of these marketing ploys or other tactics, uh, into turning over their Medicare information and oftentimes they, they may act or call on the phone acting as if they're Medicare, uh, they're calling from Medicare. Um, remember that once you turn over that information, uh, it is no longer in your control. And so, uh, unfortunately, we frequently see where a fraudulent provider will, uh, will bill not just for maybe a service. You know, they, were, they convinced you, Sheila, to give me your Medicare information and we'll get you, we'll send you a cheek swab and you can get a, a free cancer screening test to identify your risk of, of getting cancer later in life. And Medicare will pay for it. It's not going to cost you a penny. Um, and they may turn around and do that, uh, and you may not be aware that that's actually a fraudulent bill because Medicare doesn't cover curiosity uh, screening tests for, for cancer. Um, but they may also then turn around and take your information and pass that on or, or either use it themselves to bill for other services that you had no idea that, that they were going to bill for and you didn't receive. Or, or they may even take that and sell that to someone else. Uh, that is going to use your information again to continue to bill Medicare or Medicaid or even private insurance for other, if you have it, for, mm -hmm. for other services or items um, that you have no idea is, is occurring. We see a lot of these lists wind up on the dark web and then not only do you have to worry about medical identity theft, but there could be other kinds of theft as well where they could take your identity, open accounts in your name and that type of thing. And so for vulnerable populations, people who are, you know, at home and require care, is it ever appropriate for 
that caretaker to ask for the person's Medicare? It would be unusual, not necessarily uh, inappropriate, but usually before the individual comes out to provide that care, that exchange of information has already occurred between your doctor's office and the home health agency. Um, like Shimon said, if you know who the provider is, they're already providing you care, that's probably pretty safe as opposed to someone that just knocks on the door or gives you a phone call. But the important thing is patients should remember that, that they are in the driver's seat. They're the gatekeeper. It's their information, and they have the right to ask questions and to gain additional information in order to feel comfortable with turning over their, uh, their Medicare information. And they shouldn't allow a any provider, and they should be very uh, ask a lot of questions if, in fact, they feel like a provider or someone pretending to be a provider is bullying them into turning that information over. Uh, the patient's in the driver's seat. You're in control. Can you provide new methods to identify fraud, waste, or abuse? So maybe uh, new investigative techniques or tactics that you all are doing. I know uh, we're really moving on the forefront of data analytics. So uh, we, uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, we don't discuss uh, some of the cutting edge investigative technology or investigative techniques, law enforcement techniques that we use. Uh, in, in furtherance of our investigations. But uh, certainly we can say that OI, at OIG we are harnessing the power of modern technology uh, and advanced data analytics in order to uh, identify uh, potential fraud, to detect it early on, uh, and then to, as close to real time as possible, uh, address uh, that f the fraudulent activity, um, both to hold accountable bad actors as well as to prevent uh, maybe a, a, an emerging fraud scheme from spreading uh, into a broader national problem. Okay, and actually, Mike, can you just give the viewers um, some perspective in terms of how data has helped us work faster and smarter? Um, do you have any examples off the tip of your tongue of, you know, years ago it used to take X amount of time to get this data and now we're able to see things more in real time. Most of our investigations originated early on. They spawned off of other investigations. Um, these days we're doing more proactive approach and looking at the data and we're able to uh, move very quickly when we see an anomaly in the data. So our whole mindset and the way we approach things has drastically changed just in the past couple of years. We were talking about genetic testing a little bit ago. Uh, we did a massive effort to move forward with that. Um, with our data analytics and, and jumped on that massive fraud right away. Okay. okay, we have another question. How do you foresee the proposed rule changes of the Stark Law anti-kickbacks will help reduce fraud, waste, and abuse? Well, it's, it, it's important to understand that at, at the end of the day, what, when we are conducting healthcare fraud investigations, we are uh, looking for a lie, a theft. And so uh, addressing that underlying theft, that lie, that deception of the patient or of the American taxpayer um, doesn't change the foundation of our law enforcement efforts. Uh, what we will continue to do is engage in uh, education, uh, both to, to the industry and to the patients, uh, in terms of you know, how these uh, changes uh, to the law uh, affect them. Uh, our Office of Counsel puts out some uh, excellent uh, industry guidance uh, that can help uh, providers understand what the differences mean or what the, the, the changes mean. Um, and at the end of the day, if a provider is, is doing the right thing and are putting patients above profits and, and uh, upholding their Hippocratic Oath, then they have nothing to be concerned of. Um, however, those uh, doctors out there that would uh, take advantage of the patients and, and would steal from, uh, from the taxpayer and from the American public, um, th they should know that we will be coming for them and we will hold them accountable. Okay. Another question, how many people call the Medicare tip line annually? Are there any new, oh, there we go, that's the end of that question. Uh, what? Past couple of years, it's it's been in the tens of thousands. I, I, I think yep. it's 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 a lot. We get a lot lot of calls to our to our hotline every year. It's uh, both through through our website uh, portal uh, as well as through uh, through the hotline, the one eight hundred HHS tips number. Uh, the thousands and thousands of, of calls uh, every year. 
Um, and it's important uh, that the viewers know that we do assess those. Um, they don't just go into oblivion, um, but we have a team of folks that, that work very diligently on, uh, on going through that information and uh, making sure that it gets in the hands of the right people to address it, uh, whether that's within our agency, at other agencies, uh, whether it's a matter for an agent to go investigate in the field or for our Office of Counsel to look at uh, uh, in a different arena. And actually to follow up with that, because we get this question a lot, Mike, can you just address the issue of when people say, I called in, I reported a tip, and I haven't heard anything? Yeah, we, that's, a, that's a common question that, that, that people have. Um, when someone calls in and we start an investigation, we can't go publicizing that we're, we're, we're doing an investigation. So we have to uh, uh, look at the data of, of what's, what's occurring, and we may be doing some sort of an investigation. We may already have that individual uh, under investigation, um, but we don't loop back with individuals and tell them about open and active investigations. We just can't. So most of the time they should not expect No, to we have to worry about all. operational security dur during an investigation and uh, the rights and privacy uh, of the uh, provider as well. Um, so we, we, don't, we don't give feedback on, on the stages of the investigation. At some point, if the investigation comes to a conclusion, it's, it's publicly announced and they'll be able to find out if there was something that came out of that. Okay. Are there any other new schemes out there besides genetic testing and the BRACE scheme? Anything else that you all are seeing that you are able to share? There's, al there's always new iterations of the old schemes sor sort of things, whether it be pharmaceuticals or the, um, uh, the, the BRACE scams. Uh, there's always new Medicare rules coming out that people try to find holes in and try to generate new, new, new ways around something that we're doing. So it's not always that there's, there's uh, a, a new scam going on. It's, it's just a re-swizzling of, of the old one. Uh, recently there was, a, um, uh, there was a, an ear acupuncture um, device that was being, being uh, sold. And what they were billing for was an implantable um, nerve stimulator. So again, that goes to back what we said at, at, at your original question. It's the provision of uh, a non-covered service that was billed as a covered service. So that was an example of something that came up just recent. And one of the most pervasive trends in, in healthcare fraud right now is the use of, of telemarketing um, to solicit, solicit patients for products or for services um, that they may or may not need um, under the guise of telemedicine. Um, and so it's important to, uh, for patients to be aware uh, of the difference between true telemedicine where uh, perhaps they've sought out care from a provider and they've had interaction with the provider and, and consulted with that provider about their health care uh, needs and, and services and, and received uh, services from that doctor um, versus someone calling them out of the blue and marketing to them. Uh, for a product or for a healthcare service that not in the best interest that they the may patients. or may not even need or they weren't they weren't looking for. And some of the tele telemarketing companies we're finding recently are not even in this country. They're they're calling from overseas. Interesting. All right. How often should people and vendors be checked against the exclusions list? So this is uh, this is really important, and not all of you, the viewers may understand. But the exclusions list is is essentially like Mike talked about before. When when we find a bad actor and and we and they are held accountable, uh, whether it's through a, a criminal conviction or otherwise, um, we will take it a, 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 the the we essentially we'll, we'll boot them out of the program through an exclusion, so that they can no longer bill Medicare or Medicaid or other federal health care programs um, at all. And so uh, providers and, and healthcare companies out there have an obligation um, to, to check uh, against the, the exclusions list that, that is publicly available to ensure that they're not inadvertently employing someone or they're not facilitating uh, indirectly billing to Medicare and Medicaid by someone who's been barred uh, from the program. Is it every time they bring on a new employee or we update our exclu exclusions list each month? Um, is it every time a new employee comes on board they should check it? It should be checked every time you bring a new employee on board because if you build on behalf of that employee for a couple of years and then you found out they were excluded, um, all of that money has to be paid back. Those were not legitimate claims that were submitted. All right. So I think this will be our last question here. So how can a provider know 
what the current schemes are being played out or what current schemes are being played out in their area? Well, one of the easiest ways that a provider can, you know, uh, be aware of what's going on in their area um, is to follow our website. Um, there's uh, information or, or, uh, uh, or I'm sure any of our social media uh, feeds. Um, but on the website, there's frequently information, uh, press releases, uh, and others, both for uh, federal uh, law enforcement action against healthcare providers in different areas, as well as uh, state action, say, by the Medicaid fraud control units. And the Senior Medicare Patrol in the local area will have whatever the local flavor is for the frauds in their particular area, so they may want to reach out to them as well. All right. Well, uh, great tips. Thank you both for those answers and sharing that valuable information with our viewers. So that's a wrap for us. We know there are a few questions that we didn't get to, so we'll follow up in the comment section after we wrap. Thank you for watching. And together, we can fight healthcare fraud and help to protect people and patients. Thanks again to Shimon and Mike for joining us. And if you suspect healthcare fraud, waste, or abuse, please report it to our fraud hotline. And for more information, visit our website at oig.hhs.gov. Thank you.